Velios says that after Heraclius uh, conquered uh, Persia, he kicked the Jews out of Edessa. Those Jews of Nehemiah ben Hushiel who were barricaded up in Edessa, they were kicked out of uh, Edessa. This would be around at least after the year 628. And they went to seek refuge in Tajikistan. Edessa is where the Jews were. And Heraclius throws them out and they go and seek refuge down here in Tajikistan. So this would be during the reign of probably Hanzala or and then after Hanzala, this Hormis VI was also ruling the area around that time. And it says that, uh, Sebius says that they didn't manage to establish any kind of uh, union uh, or they didn't manage to persuade the people of Tajikistan to fight for them to go back to take control of Jerusalem again. They were not successful until, according to Sebius, there arose amongst them somebody who was very learned in the laws of Moses, uh, an Ishmaelite, that means a Sadducee, because uh, I haven't explained yet on this video why Sadducees and Ishmaelites are the same people, but it's to do with um, the conversion of the Ishmaelites of Nabatea by somebody called Alexander Yanius, uh, he was one of the Hasmonean kings, descendant of the Maccabees. Um, for reasons best known to himself, I suppose, some people have suggested it's because he wanted to have more wives. He abandoned traditional Judaism. He threw out the Mishnah, which I talked about before, and he started a new religion called, which we call the Sadducee religion. But uh, he exiled all the traditional Jews from the land, the Jewish authorities, the Jewish rabbis. He kicked them out of the land and many of them went under somebody called Judah ben Tabai to settle in Egypt for a while. And uh, meanwhile, Alexander Yanius went and conquered Nabatea and he converted all of the uh, Ishmaelites of Nabatea to his new religion, Sadducee religion. So when we talk about Sadducees, for example, Sadducees in the New Testament they are Ishmaelites. They are followers of, of this religion, which was established by Al, uh, Alexander Yanius. So um, that's, if, if you want to know if Ishmaelites are actually mentioned in the New Testament, they are. They're called Sadducees. And that's uh, recorded by Josephus, Josephus, and it's also part of Jewish tradition. I have uh, a, a friend called uh, Rabbi Ben Abrahamson, and he has done a lot of work, and he has also published, published a book about the Ishmaelite Sadducee uh, religion and their, 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 um, uh, their connection to the origins of Islam. I don't agree with everything that he says, but, but what, what I do agree with is everything that he says, which is from the Jewish tradition, because we don't disagree on those Jewish matters. We just disagree on other matters of interpretation which are not related to Judaism. Nevertheless, so when we say Sadducees, we mean Ishmaelites. When we say Ishmaelites, we mean Sadducees. So I don't make a distinction in my mind when I'm speaking. If I say Ishmaelite, I mean Sadducee. If I say Sadducee, I mean Ishmaelite. I don't make a distinction in my mind because that's how, that's how my Jewish education, I should say, is, 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 is in, 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 in affecting me. So, um, so what Sebius tells us is that there arises amongst these people in Tajikistan an Ishmaelite, i.e. Sadducee, who is very learned in the Torah, the laws of Moses. Obviously, this guy is not a pagan. He's obviously a practitioner of Judaism. Who studies the Torah? I mean, nobody studies the Torah except a sect of Jews. So this guy was of a sect of Jews. And he uh, raises, it says, Sebius says he, he rose to prominence and he managed to establish this union between these Jews who were ev evicted from Edessa and the Ishmaelites in uh, Tajikistan. And uh, according to Sebios, he inspires them to go on a campaign to conquer the Holy Land. Um, there is something interesting, and I just always find it interesting, from the Abbasid narrative, from the Abbasid stories, they say that there was around the year 633 that somebody called Khalid came along and tried to invade and conquered Hira, which is where Iyas ibn Kabisa was. So they finally conquered Iyas. 10 years later, uh, they managed to finally conquer Iyas ibn Kabisa in year 633 in um, Hira. Um, but it seems very shortly after that, that the, the, the Persians rose up and had a kind of a, a, a resurgence in Hira and they kicked Khalid out of Hira. And then he went off to the west to conquer um, the, 
the Holy Land. So the story in, in the Islamic narrative is it's Khalid left Persia and went to conquer the Holy Land. But the story in Sebios says it's this, this Mahmet person who uh, left the Tajikistan area and went to conquer the Holy Land. And then we have another reference to the, to the, to the battle of a battle just outside of Gaza, where Thomas the Presbyter refers to the Tayaya of Mahmed fighting outside Gaza. So the Tayaya, remember when? Let me when just stop you here, Joe. Yes. Joe, yes. in both those references, Sabaeus and Thomas the Presbyter, who do refer to Mahmed, are you? Uh, am I hearing you correct that you are saying this is Ilyas to Kabisa? No, not at all. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. You were talking about Ilyas, so I'm, I'm, I'm confused now. Who is it that you're referring to here then? I'm talking about the person just called Mahmed in, uh, in Sebios and Mahmed in Thomas the Presbyter's sources, who okay. seems to match the campaign of Khalid in... Uh, well, he absolutely matches the campaign of Khalid, Khalid in the standard Islamic narrative. But the interesting thing is that um, Sebios gives him another name. Sebios also calls him Amr, A-M-R-H. And uh, it seems that Sebios is giving him this name because he thinks it's like a title, like Amir. So he thinks his name is Muhammad and he's calling him an Amir. But this name Amr also appears in various other sources at the same time. We have uh, Coptic sources referring to Amr. We have um, Syriac sources referring to an, an Emir. And we have Byzantine sources referring to an Ambros. And uh, we have also got the leader at this time. It's the year 634 now. And the leader now, according to the standard Islamic narrative, is somebody called Omar. Now, very interesting about all these names. Omar, Amr are two variants of the same root word, meaning long life, longevity or immortality in, in, in Arabic. Um, the name Ambros, which is the name given to the same conqueror by the Byzantines when he's in, in a story called the, um, the martyrdom of, uh, the, uh, of 60 martyrs of Gaza, is Ambros, which is, you may know the word Ambrose, Ambrosia. Ambrosia, the food of the gods, it's immortality. So he's also called immortal in the uh, Byzantine sources. So we have different languages, but the same meaning. And that's very, very interesting and I think important because even the name Khaled is another variant in Arabic of the same meaning again. So Khaled, Amr, Omar and Ambrose all have the same meaning in their name. And I think that's more than the coincidence. I think what we're talking about here is that there was a name which was known and the people who are writing it down are just translating it into their own languages. So it gets translated into Greek as Ambrose. It gets translated in two different ways into Arabic, once as Khalid, once as Omar. And it probably comes from Amr, which was the original name probably for this guy, which is what, um, uh, John, uh, Sebios, which Sebios gives him this name too. Now, a lot of people think that when Sebios is talking about Mahmed and Amr, that he's talking about two different leaders. But if you read Sebios very carefully, there is no indication of a change in leadership from the time when he's talking about Mahmed until the time he's talking about Amr. It's, it's, he's talking about the same leader all the way. He doesn't mention a new leader. And whenever there is a new leader, Sebios mentions it. But Sebios doesn't distinguish Mahmed from Amr. He, he uses the same, it's like the same leader is doing the same campaign. He doesn't say he, that Mohammed died or anything like that. So what we have is several sources referring to um, a leader of the Arabs or, or the Ishmaelites coming from uh, the east to invade uh, the Holy Land. And all the names in all of the sources have the same basic meaning. All of these sources, by the way, if you're interested in a book called Islam as Others Saw It by Robert Hoyland. So you should get that. Um, the connection, by the way, between um, Omar and Amr was given by Tom Holland. Not, it's not my idea. It's Tom Holland's idea. Uh, he was the one who came up with that suggestion. Um, and what book are you referring to there? That's the one. Actually, that's just a conversation uh, on Twitter with Tom Holland.
you have to go and follow my uh, Twitter account and you'll look at my conversations. You can see the discussion there where I make a, a, a comment on uh, on that with Tom Holland's suggestion there. So that's just a live discussion on Twitter. Here's Ho Hoyland's book that came out in 1997. Uh, it's really uh, packed with material, much of the material that uh, that Joe's talking about, that Mel has talked about earlier, you can get from that book. It's, it's a kind of a treasure trove. It's a treasure it's trove, yeah. I think it's, it's, it, sh it should be required reading for anybody who wants to understand and follow this because that's, the, that's where all of these sources are. They're all in there. Um, and he should get credit for that. You know, <laughs> we, we didn't, we're not the scholars who, who, who went and dug up those sources. It's, it's Robert Hoyland who did that. And it's Tom Holland who made the, made the connection um, we're and just saying over and over again that, that really it is Hoyland who did us all a favor because he he reads and writes 18 languages and uh, yeah I've been in his office I, I know him in fact he was going to be my second supervisor for my doctorate way back in the 1990s when I was thinking of doing it and mm -hmm. I remember when at that time I thought I thought he was such a young looking guy how did he know that many languages and yet, uh, the, because of that ability, he was able to go back to all these original documents in all these languages, some of which no longer are used today, and yeah. be able to translate them into English so that we can read them, so we can have them. Now, did he come to conclusions? Not necessarily. No. He, he stood back. He did not want to come to conclusions. We're doing that for him. And so yeah. what we're doing, and what you're doing, Joe, and what Mel and Murad and, and Odon there in, in France are doing, is taking what he gave us yeah and then this is how you then follow it through that's our job to do that and then, of course the rest who are watching that's their job to do that as well i like to think that what we're doing is we're reading between the lines i think it's implied and he would probably deny this but i mean you can't say what we're saying and and have and and, and, and keep an academic seat you're going to lose it you're not going to have your reputation if if you're in a very well established academic uh, um, uh, establishment with, with serious reputation to consider and then you're going to say something like this which is going to upset a lot of Muslims you're going to lose your seat and you're going to lose your reputation so he doesn't say anything he doesn't say what we're saying but all the sources are there for anybody who's got a brain to put it together you just put it together and think of it and reflect and reflect and it's reading between the lines there is a historical person he lived at least his references beginning in the year 634 and uh, he doesn't seem to have much to do with Islam. So um, all of these sources are basically talking about a leader of the, of the, the Ishmaelites who comes from this area and comes to invade this area. And um, uh, the names all have the same meaning. So, what happens according to the so the first source we have is this Thomas the Presbyter who talks about this invasion or this battle happening just outside of Gaza and I should probably have a bigger map but Gaza is basically down here and so just outside of Gaza there's around here south of Jerusalem there's this invasion going on mentioned by Thomas the Presbyter in year 634 which corresponds with uh, Sebius saying so Thomas the Presbyter and Sebios both agree that there was some kind of invasion from Tajikistan, the Tayaya, from Tajikistan, to this area around the year 634. And they both say that Mahmed was the leader at that time. Then we have the Byzantine source of what happened when they got into Gaza, the martyrdom of 60 Gazas. Now, I, I'm saying he's, he's clearly from a Jewish background. So we've also got the doctrine of Jacobi, remember, which talks about... Uh, this um, it's it's a book which is written for Jews allegedly by Jews. Uh, it's actually the Byzantine uh, it's referred to as Byz Byzantine propaganda to encourage Jews to convert to Christianity. But it's allegedly written for Jews by Jews, and it mentions this prophet among the Arabs. Okay, sorry, the prophet among the Saracens. Um, now, for Jews by Jews, a prophet refers to what nation? Only the Jewish nation. It doesn't refer to a non-Jewish nation. There is no concept for us of, of a prophet who's going to come, who's, who we should pay attention to from a nation other than the Jews. So when it talks about this prophet among the Saracens, it means a Jewish prophet among the Saracens. So we should understand the doctrine of Jacobi as a reference to a Jew amongst the Saracens, not as anything else. It's a Jew. That's common sense. Um, and uh, this prophet among the Saracens could be a reference to Nehemiah ben Hushiel 20 years beforehand. It could be just late information which is coming through. Or it could be 
a reference to this <clears throat> Mahmed person that Sebios writes about and, and uh, Thomas the Presbyter writes about coming into, to, into, into the Holy Land with a sword. And the conclusion in the doctrine of Jacobi is that a prophet doesn't come with the sword. Um, so would they reject this person as obviously just, well, okay, he's Jewish, but he's not a prophet because prophets don't come with a sword. <clears throat> and that would also be uh, emphasized if the guy was a, a Sadducee because Jews wouldn't be interested in a Sadducee uh, prophet or anybody who claimed to be a prophet if they were from a Sadducee background. But then also we've got this um, martyrdom of the 60 Gazas, uh, so, so 60 martyrs in Gaza. And when he comes into Gaza, uh, he forces uh, these 60 Byzantine soldiers to renounce Christ uh, or die. They don't renounce Christ, so he beheads them all. He cuts off their heads. So this is um, uh, interesting. Why would somebody, I mean, who, who, what kind of people would be concerned about uh, people who are believing in the wrong Christ? I mean, um, Hosrau's people invaded. Okay, the Jews were uh, led by Nehemiah and Ben-Hushiel and they were killing a lot of Christians at that time. But uh, they were conquering to take over their land again. But who is it that's going to be trying to say, hey, you, you, you have to renounce your belief in Christ. We don't want you to believe in a Messiah. Christ means Messiah. No, renounce a belief in Messiah. They want you to say, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. So what kind of people are these who are saying Jesus is not Messiah? Is that Muslims? No. Muslims say that Jesus is the Messiah. So, right. so they're not going to be Muslims who are coming and saying renounce the Messiah. Are they Christians? No, no, they're not Christians who are telling you to be Mount Renounce Messiah. Do pagans care? They don't no. care. You can have any religion you like as long as you just pay your taxes and accept the king. Khosrow was like that. They would prefer to call themselves the, the, the chief god or something like that. And, and that, that's, they don't care what your religion is as long as you recognize them as the greatest god. That's okay. So who is it that concerned about Messiah? Obviously some kind of Jewish sect. That's in keeping with what Sebios was saying. He's a, he's a Sadducee Ishmaelite. He doesn't want people to believe in, in, a, in, a, in a Messiah, probably because he thinks he's the Messiah. So that's why he's telling them to renounce their belief in a, a Jewish Messiah. Then the next thing we hear is Sophronius telling us that he's out, he's, that they've reached Bethlehem. And then we hear that, um, that Sophronius has, is handing over Jerusalem to them, that they've conquered Jerusalem. And we have these interesting stories from the Abbasid stories, from the Abbasid sources, which I think we can take because they're echoes of this historical reality, which is happening on the ground down here. They've come across from the east. They've come to Gaza. They've gone to Jerusalem. There's something real, real happening here in the time of, of Omar. So this conquest is, is, is described accurately in the time of Omar. And we have some interesting stories. Yes, Sophronius did surrender Jerusalem. He was the patriarch of Jerusalem. The Abbasid stories get that correct. So we can say this is an echo. This is an echo of something historical. And they say some interesting stories that um, Sophronius invited Omar to come and pray at the Holy Sepulchre. And I'm going to show you a picture of the Holy Sepulchre now. Joe, while you're doing that, we're, just so we get the dates correct, when you're yeah. talking about, uh, the when you're referring to the Doctrine of Iacobi and Thomas the Presbyter, this is 634, yeah. and they're referring to Muhammad, that's 634. Now with Sophronius, when he gives over in a, and actually gives up Jerusalem, we're now in 638. Uh, no, he dies in 638. He gives it up in 636, 637. So okay. Sophronius died in 638. This is, the, this is a, interesting about the Kaaba. Now, this is a poem by Sophronius. He says in his poem, let me walk thy pavements and go inside the Anastasis, where the king of all rose again, trampling down the power of death. I will venerate the sweet floor and gaze on the holy cube. What is cube in Arabic? Kaaba. I will gaze upon the holy Kaaba. Oh, who's writing this? A Muslim? No. And the great four, and then there's some words missing because it's an ancient text which is lost. It's a poem by Sophronius. For something like heavens. Through the divine sanctuary, I will penetrate the divine tomb and with deep reverence will venerate that worthy tomb surrounded by its conches and columns surmounted by golden lilies. I shall be overcome with joy, says Sophronius. And he's talking about this Kaaba here. Do you know what this is? This is the the sepulchre and the two. Church of the, the sepulchre in Jerusalem, isn't that? Yes, it is. That's right. 
So this was originally a cube. It's been rebuilt several times, but it was a cube. And that's the Kaaba, which is being referred, referred to by Sophronius. So interestingly, um, Sophronius invites Omar to pray here, but Omar declines. And he says, no, lest, the, uh, lest his people, his people, his armies consider it to be, uh, 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 the, the Islamic sources say, a Muslim uh, place of prayer, a masjid. So what we know is that this man is actually a Sadducee Jew and he has declined to pray in here because Jews won't pray in a place like that. But he must have found it very shocking and surprising that having gone around massacring Christians, as soon as he, uh, he goes to Jerusalem, Sophronius hands it over to him and immediately invites him to pray. And that must have been quite a shocking, like, why aren't you my enemy sort of moment? It's like, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean inviting me to pray? This is the... 63667. Um, and instead, we hear uh, in Islamic sources that he that um, Omar uh, consults somebody called Kab al Akbar, who is a Jew, who uh, together they decide that they're going to build, rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount and they start clearing the Temple Mount. Kab al Akbar was with Nehemiah ben Hushiel, according to this standard Islamic narrative. When Nehemiah ben Hushiel's um, uh, forces were in Jerusalem, um, only 20 years beforehand, that they started to clear the Temple Mount. I should probably get a picture of the Temple Mount at this point. So he refuses to pray in the, in the um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and instead they go to the Temple Mount. Um, so... Uh, According to the standard Islamic narrative, um, Omar consults with Kabul Akbar, who is a Jew, and together they decide that they're going to continue the work which was started under Nehemiah ben Hushiel to clear the Temple Mount and restore the temple. And so they set about doing that. And according to an independent source from Sophronius, which is actually recorded and, and kept in Georgian language, Sophronius says that they build a masjid on the Temple Mount. They use the word masjid. For, for that in this Sophronius' source. He calls it an accursed masjid on the Temple Mount. So that's what happens. Then Sophronius dies. Sophronius dies in the year 638. And in the year 638, something very strange happens. Uh, Omar, uh, in according to the standard Islamic narrative, or this Amr person, or this, um, um, or what you want to call him, the Emir, let's call him the Emir, um, at least that's uh, that's fine. Just so you know, Emir begins with an Aleph and Omar begins with an Ain, but it, they could be also, because there are a couple of sources that refer to him as an Emir, that could be with foreign sources, they might not distinguish between the Ain and the Aleph, so they could just call him an Emir when actually they're referring to Omar. So anyway, the the Emir of, uh, of the, uh, the Ishmaelites appoints a patriarch in Jerusalem, not from the Byzantine uh, uh, sort of church, but uh, from the Oriental Orthodox Church. He points for the first time an Oriental Orthodox patriarch in Jerusalem called um, Abraham I of the Armenian uh, Oriental Orthodox Church, Monophysites. That's very curious, considering he was forcing people to renounce Christ not so long ago. Now he's actually allowing them to have their own leader in in, in um in Jerusalem. Okay, he's not allowing the Diophysites to have a leader, but he's allowing the Monophysite Christians to have a leader. There's a distinction between the two types of Christians. One, Diophysites represent Roman Christianity, and um, Monophysites represent Oriental Christianity. So there's, so he's not going to have the Byzantines or Roman Christianity represented there, but he's, he's softening his heart towards the, the, the Christians somehow, and he's allowing the Monophysites to have a patriarch there. Next, we hear there is a, a, a debate between him and somebody called John of the Seder. The Seder, who um, uh, is encouraging him to, well, he's, he's instructing him on the story of Jesus Christ and, and Omar is, is confused about the story of Jesus Christ. He doesn't understand this story. He doesn't believe it. Or the Emir doesn't believe this story. Um, Omar is, is familiar with these stories. And suddenly, um, um, John of the Seder is telling him different stories about Jesus. And he's saying, no, that's not true. That's not, the, that's not the stories. I don't believe you. Mm. And so they're having this debate 
and the, the, the Sadducee doesn't, the, or the Emir doesn't believe John of the Seder. And then John of the Seder says, look, we'll translate the Gospels. And he says, OK, you translate the Gospels, don't, but don't, don't refer to him as Messiah. I don't want to hear any reference to him as Messiah. And John of the Seder eventually convinces him that he should have it translated as it is. So they agree to have the first Arabic translation of the Gospels. This is around 6, 640. So they have the, agreed to have the first Arabic translations of the Gospels. And um, this Emir concedes. So you can see this progression of his character. You know, he comes in, he's killing Christians, he's massacring them, forcing them to renounce Christ. Then Jonathan, then Sophronius invents him to pray in the Holy Sepulchre, and he kind of declines. Sophronius dies and he allows the, the monophysites to have a patriarch. And now he's even allowing the translation of the Gospels into Arabic. You see how there's a there's a curve in his life here. It's a, a real change in his his attitude towards things. So they have the first translation. That the translation is carried out by, according to the, the Syriac source, it's carried out by the Tayyaya de Mahmet. Okay, so, sorry, not Tayyaya de Mahmet. It's carried out by the Tayyaya. I'm sorry, he's Mahmet. So the Tayyaya are the ones that translate the Gospels into Arabic for him for the first time. What happens next? Coptic sources and the Coptic encyclopedia say that this man, Amr, when he meets the Coptic leader of the Coptic Christians, who's called Benjamin of Alexandria, he's a monophysite Christian. He's not part of the Roman church. He's a monophysite Christian. When he meets uh, uh, Benjamin, he says that he has never met a more holy man of God than Benjamin. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he says. He's never met a more impressive man of God than Benjamin, this Coptic uh, uh, leader of the Christian Christians, Benjamin in, in Alexandria. So now this is a big problem for the standard Islamic narrative, because whether they say that this man was Amr, which is what they say, or whether it was Omar, it doesn't matter. Both of these people are supposed to be Sahaba. They're supposed to be friends of, of the prophet Muhammad. And yet here we have a record of them, of, being, of, of them saying that they'd never met a more impressive man of God than a Christian patriarch. Right. <laughs> so, so that's a big, a big uh, problem. But this is a massive change. This guy is supposed to be a Sadducee, an Ishmaelite, a scholar of the laws of Moses. He was killing Christians. And now he's saying that the most impressive man of God he's met is a Christian patriarch. So what's happened to him? Well, we have a story. It's from the standard Islamic narrative, and this might explain what's happened to him. It says that when uh, that Omar found he, he was originally a not he wasn't a believer in Islam, they say, and he found his sister reading these uh, these verses of the Quran, and uh, they were on a jawbone of a sheep. A sheep's jawbone and he was so furious that he took the sheep's jawbone this is a bit gruesome so be prepare yourselves and he took the jawbone and he smashed it on his sister's head and cracked open her skull killed her then he went and he wanted to know what was written on this jawbone because it's in a language he didn't understand so he went and got it translated and when he heard, heard the gentleness of the words which were on this he was filled with remorse and regret and he converted to the religion of his dead sister in repentance for his murdering his sister. This is quite an interesting story because it shows that there was such a violent act of, yes? You said at the beginning of this segment here that she was reading from the Quran on the jawbone. Do you mean the Quran? On the jawbone. It was verses of, it's supposed to be a verses of the Quran in the jawbone, but we have to remember that the Quran anyway, actually probably refers to the Mikra or the Karyana, which means the Bible. In Hebrew, Mikra is another word for Bible in, in, in Aramaic. Karyana is another word for the Bible. So. Because then Muslims will say, aha, so you are admitting that there was a Quran, a full Quran. So this oh, is well, not, not, the, not the Arabic Quran. I'm just using an Abbasid source here and saying there's an interesting story about his conversion based on his sister reading a passage from the Quran, the Karyana, the lectionary, the Mikra is the way I would understand that. And that's an interesting story about his conversion. But um, the, the point is, what we conversion see is that... What? Well, the Islamic stories say he converted to Islam, obviously, that's what they say. But what we do see in history is that there was a general trend 
of gentleness, starting off with aggression against Christianity, gen turning towards gentleness towards Christianity, turning towards admiration for Christian leaders more than his own religious leaders, more than his own. He's not a Christian, but he finds this Pope to be, this Pope Benjamin of, of Alexandria, that's Coptic Pope, not a Roman Pope, to be um, uh, the, the most impressive man of God that he's ever met. He's, he's translated the gospels into Arabic. And then we have this, uh, I'll just open it up. And this, uh, you may know from, um, there's actually another version of this from Robert Spencer's book, Did Mohammed Exist? And it's a, uh, there's a little, uh, this is a different version of the same coin he's bringing up here, but it's basically the Mohammed coin. And what we have is a, is a, it's the, an early Byzantine Arab coin. It's probably the earliest Byzantine Arab coin we have. And it probably dates from the, 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 the reign of this Omar Muhammad leader. It's got this little leader here holding a cross in his hand. Well, just so we're clear, what date are you giving this? I'm saying it's six, uh, 640, 644. I, I'll say around there. I think that's the date which is given in. You'll have to check with Robert Spencer, but I, I think that uh, this is a long time since I've read this book, but I think that's the date which is given in his book. So this would be the, the earliest possible Byzantine Arab coin. And it actually says in Arabic here, Muhammad. It's actually got Muhammad written down here. And this is a Byzantine Arab coin of a Christian leader. He's holding a cross and his name is Muhammad. Now, this is about the same time that Thomas the Presbyter is writing down about this time. Thomas the Presbyter is writing about, down about the invasion of the Tayyaya de Muhammad 10 years beforehand. Thomas the Presbyter doesn't know him by the name that he was using 10 years ago. Thomas the Presbyter only knows him by the name that he died under, that is Muhammad. Sebios knows about him by the name Muhammad, the name he died under. Sebios is writing the 660s. And he also refers to him as an Amir or Amr. Um, but what it looks like, I mean, we can't deny that what we have here is a king holding a cross in the word Muhammad. And there are more than one coin like this which all have him having a cross on his hand, a cross on his head and the word Muhammad down there or on the back of the coin, it'll say Muhammad. So we have these Muhammad coins and they're Byzantine Arab coins and they're of some king holding a cross. So it's like he converted to Christianity and he took on the name Muhammad. Why did he take on the name Muhammad? Is Muhammad a Christian name? Well, actually, yes, it is because these sources, Thomas the Presbyter, Sebios and this coin are the earliest references to the name Muhammad. Before that, we don't have any references to the name Muhammad. By the way, all these are written in the 640s and 660s. So we've got this coin in the 640s, we've got Thomas the Presbyter writing in the 640s, and we've got Sebios who's writing in the 660s. And those are the first three references to the word Muhammad. Um, before that, we don't have any reference to this word Muhammad except in Hebrew sources. Only in Hebrew sources we have references to the word Muhammad. This word does not exist in any Syro-Aramaic dictionary. There, you may have heard people arguing that the word Muhammad is uh, a title meaning blessed one, and it refers to Jesus. It does refer to Jesus, but it's not a title meaning blessed one. I've done extensive uh, video on why it doesn't mean the blessed one. I've used the Aramaic uh, uh, Bible to show that those verses which are supposed to be saying Muhammad in Aramaic, do not say Muhammad in Aramaic. The word which they're saying is equivalent to Muhammad in Greek is Makarios, Makarios, and uh, it doesn't equate with an Aramaic word Muhammad. It doesn't exist in Aramaic, nor in Syriac. This is a, a copy of the Aramaic uh, Bible, chapter 5, verse 3, and we've got the word here, the first word here, which they're translating here is happiness for the poor in spirit. Well, the word here that they're using, if you can't read it, that's tov, tove, tovechem. So um, I've got it open here, tov, T-W-B, they've put it down as tov, Arabic taib, equivalent to Hebrew tov. And that's the word which is being used here. So definitely not Muhammad. Uh, it's not the word Muhammad. That is the word which is used in the uh, Greek New Testament as makarios in these cases, but blessed are you, blessed are you. But here it's not. Here it's from the word tov, which we have down here. The etymology is given 
uh, good, goodness, good things, glory, fruits, produce, resources, products, income, wealth, blessings, blessings, happiness, bliss, beatitude. So, uh, no, uh, that is not what it says there. So shall we have a look at the other one? The other one is when it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which happens to be in chapter 21, verse, uh, this is chapter 21 you see here. And in verse nine, this is the word here, uh, which we can copy. And uh, the word here is, this is the sentence. If you look in chapter 29, it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, this word next to it, just so you know, this says David. And this one is blessed is he, blessed. So um, again, in fact, that word is here. And it's pronounced barik, barik, as in like baruch in Hebrew, barik. This is blessed. So this is the blessed one. Uh, the adjective used for this form. So again, we don't have the word Muhammad here or anything like Ahmed. This is the word which is used in the New Testament as Makarios both times. But it does exist in Hebrew. So I'll show you. This is, I've spoken about before, the first time I met you, Jay, I was talking about these verses. This is, these verses are from, these are the only times that the word Muhammad appears in the Hebrew Bible. Muhammad, that's not Muhammadim, not Muhammadim, this is Muhammad. And it appears in Ezekiel and in Hosea. The correct translation is the King James Version here, where it says it translates it as a pleasant place for their silver. It's referring to, the, these are prophetic references to the temple. It means cherished. The word Muhammad means cherished. And these are prophetic references to the temple. So the temple is the cherished thing of Israel, the pleasant place of Israel, where, where all the treasures of Israel are inside of this place, if you like. But the word is Mahmed, not Makarios. The word is Mahmed and Hebrew, and it refers to the temple. But why would this be a Christian word? I said this is a Christian word. How is this a Christian word? It's a messianic Christian word because the temple, from a messianic point of view, this is John 2.21 refers to the temple of the body of Christ. The temple of the body of Christ is what he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll res restore it again. He was talking, talking of the, the temple of his body. He was talking about the temple of his body, the temple of the body of Christ. Now the body of Christ, this is, this is going to take you onto the depths of Judaism now. The body of Christ we know about from a very, very deep and important book called the Shir Koma. Measure of Stature. It's a Jewish book on the nature of the Messiah's soul, the spirit of the Messiah, who we know in Judaism, the spirit of the Messiah is spoken of in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 2, where it said the spirit of God hovered over the waters or moved on the face of the waters. The spirit of God, Ruach Elohim. This word, Ruach Elohim, refers to the soul of the Messiah, according to Judaic teaching. In Judaism, all Jews know this. This is Judaism. Ask your rabbi if you, if you dispute with me and you think that I'm uh, actually just misrepresenting Judaism to, um, to appease the Christians. If there's any Jew out there who's thinking that about me, shame on you. Go and check with your rabbi. The fact of the matter is um, that soul of the messiah the spirit of the messiah in judaism is called the spirit of god and this sheer comma gives us a lot of description about the nature of the spirit of god um and it's a very interesting book it's full of uh sort of um secret words like you have at the beginning of certain chapters of the quran like alif lam mim alif lam mim ra and uh, all these things they're all inside of here many of these secret sort of letters are inside of here but the interesting thing about this book is it gives us very clear de definition of who it is that we're talking about. Um, and uh, that is most clear in this part of the Shio Koma, where it describes his, him as sh uh, shining white and ruddy. His head is purest gold. His locks are curls. His eyes are like doves by a stream of water. His cheeks are like beds of spices. It's from the Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. Um, sprouting aromatic scents. His lips are like are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are coils of gold, inset with ruby. 
His loins are fine wrought ivory. His mouth is sweetest drink of all, all of him delight. This is my lover. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is in the Hebrew word we have for this verse, Mahamadim. So Mahamadim is the, in this book, this is the Shir Koma. The Shir Koma is about the body of Christ. Okay, the body of Christ. That's the soul, the nefesh, the body of Christ. Because body is the nefesh in Hebrew. So this is the Mahamadim. This is about the, the, the Shir Koma is the measurement of the body. Measurement of the body. The Shir Koma is the measurement of the body. So the body of whom? The body of Christ, which is described here uh, in the Shir Koma. This is Mahamadim, you see there, it is Psalm 516, it says they call him holy, desirable, altogether lovely. There's a lovely, actually, there's a lovely um, Christian song which people use when they sing in, Messi in, in, in evangelical churches. They sing it when they have the Eucharist. It's called Altogether Lovely, or Here I Come to Worship. You might have heard of it. And it's very interesting. You know the song. It's very interesting because, no, sorry? We sing it in our church as well. Yeah, and it's 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 very relevant because um, the, you know Je here I come to worship. And um, when uh, when uh, Jesus left his uh, body for his disciples, says, "This is my body. Do this in memory of me." And and it's it's exactly. I, I'm very impressed when I see this because I think to myself it must have been written by some uh, ex-Jew who became a Christian or Messianic Jew because it's it's such a deep reference to the sheer comma and understanding that the body of Christ is this. Is this thing, this Mohammedan, altogether lovely? It's like, who's going to know that except a, except a Jew? Nobody's going to know that. Or the Holy Spirit reveals it, maybe. But the, the point is, it's, it's, it's very impressive uh, that, that that song actually exists about the, the body of Christ, isn't it? So, um, and that's Mohammedan. You know, there's an awful lot of uh, Christians who do read their Old Testament and are, would be uh, uh, certainly familiar with Song of Psalms 5.16. Yes, but would they know that Mohammedim was the body of Christ as it's uh, in the Shia comma? I mean, who would know that except the Hebrew? I think, well, we have to discuss this because so we know about it, but I think others would be also aware of this. I don't know who the author of that particular song is. I'm sure that they would have known about this because this is not, this is not unknown. Okay. Anyway, it's, back to your story. So, um, so it's about the body of Christ and the temple of the body of Christ, the temple of the body of Christ. This is not the body of Christ, the, the temple of the body of Christ is Mahmad. Mahmad is the temple of the body of Christ, which, ref, which corresponds exactly to John 2, 21, where it says he's talking about the temple of his body, the temple of the body of him, the, the temple of the body of Christ. So... So this uh, choose, choice of the name Muhammad um, is indicating somebody who's familiar with the Shir Koma, which was very popular amongst a group of Messianic Sadducees who were called Magarites. Um, so he's familiar with the Shir Koma. It's, by the way, the Shir Koma is written by Rabbi Ishmael. So the followers of the Shir Koma are also called Ishmaelite Jews. So he's familiar with the Shir Koma, but he's also accepting that the temple of, uh, since he's holding a cross here, that the temple of uh, Muhammadim is not a building made of bricks and stone, but is a living, a living being or, or a living, uh, somebody who looks like a human being. And he's, no, I man, suspect, just, yes. Just inter, inter, uh, interject here. Could this, since it is coming from Christian sources, Christians are very well aware that Christ when uh, he took on the function of the temple, when he yes. became, died and rose again. And he yes. took on that. Why, uh, that's why Christians, the body of Christ is the temple, is Christ himself. There's, that a, distinction, is there's a distinction in Judaism. That's the interesting thing. Because uh, the, the word Mahmed and the word Muhammadim are two different words. And they refer to different things. Muhammadim is the body and Muhammad is the temple. And, and it's interesting in the, in the, in the Greek, uh, you have also got the reference to him, destroy this temple in three days, I'll rebuild it again. And the temple he's referring to is the temple of the body of him, the, the temple of the body of Christ. And he gives he the, a function that the temple had before he died and rose again. That's what he's saying there. Would not this coin be saying the same thing? Well, his saying is that he's devoting himself to the body, uh, sorry, the temple of the body, which... He had previously been persecuting. He, he didn't believe in the crucified temple. 
he believed the temple was a building. He was trying to build it on the temple mount there. He was trying to focus on that. He was killing people who, who were calling themselves Christians. Then gradually he's softened his heart towards Christians. And finally, he has a coin with him holding a cross and he's changed his name from Omar. He's changed it to Muhammad. And uh, the, 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 the understanding there is clear because he's devoting himself to the one he persecuted. It's like, a, it's very interesting because he's just gone on his journey of conquering the Holy Land from the south to the north on the way to Damascus. And it's like on the way to Damascus in his conquest on the way to Damascus, he has a Paul moment. He's like, I've been, cru I've been crucifying and persecuting all these Christians all the way. And finally he realizes and he embraces and the Christ and de devotes himself to the crucified Lord by choosing this name, Muhammad, the specific name for the temple which was destroyed and rose again in three days. He chooses this name, not Muhammadim, or which would be Ahmed in Arabic. He doesn't choose that name, which would be declaring himself to be the Messiah. Um, he chooses Muhammad and he's holding a cross. Now you could say, okay, maybe he, he would call himself Muhammad if he was imitating Christ and trying to present himself as an alternative temple of, of Muhammadim, the soul of the Messiah, except that on his coins, he's holding a cross. Uh, so, 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 so he's clearly changed his mind. He's clearly converted uh, to, right. to this, this new belief. And then what happens, we don't know, but he disappears. According to the standard Islamic narrative, he gets assassinated immediately. So... Mm -hmm. Um, and that makes sense because the Sadducees are not going to take a, a leader who suddenly converted to Sadducee, from Sadducee religion to suddenly accepting um, Jesus as the Messiah and putting crosses on their coins. They're going to assassinate him and they're, they're, they're going to get rid of him quickly. So um, then he's replaced by, obviously, he has appointed his successor. And it's uh, in a standard Islamic narrative, they call him Uthman. <laughs>